The Russian war of attrition, focused mainly on Avdivka, continues. There is still no beautiful breakthrough, as General Zeluzhny put it, and we should not expect it anytime soon with highly fortified and mined defensive lines on both sides. Ukraine is working on more aid from its allies, while Russia keeps sending more and more outdated tanks from its reserves. Welcome to the latest update on the unprovoked Russian invasion of Ukraine. This video was sponsored by our kind YouTube members and patrons. Becoming a YouTube member or patron is the best way to support our work, so we're now providing our supporters with exclusive videos to thank them. Join their ranks to watch the Pacific War series, alongside the First Punic War, Sulla's biography, the Italian War of Unification, Risorgimento, the Russo-Japanese War, Albigensian Crusade, History of Prussia, and much more. 80 or so exclusive videos in total. In 2024, YouTube members and patrons will watch series on the Fall of Sparta, the Reconquista, Second Punic War, Spanish War of Succession, and Russian Civil War, and will continue getting early access to all videos, access to an exclusive Discord server, will know our schedule, and vote on future videos. YouTube member and patron support allows us to keep the majority of our videos free in a world where YouTube monetization income is very uneven. If you want to support our work, join their ranks today via the link in the description and pinned comment. Thank you! In the second half of November, Russia made some progress in the Avdivka sector. On November 19th, Russian units, which included the Pyatnashka Brigade and the so-called Savage Division, broke through the lines fortified in 2014 near the Yatsinovata II station to the south of Avdivka. Heavy fighting was also reported near Saska Ohota. By November 25th, the Russians fully captured the Yatsinovata II station after days of bloody combat. As a result, they now have control over elevated land in the south of the Avdivka sector, which is going to cause additional problems for the Ukrainian units defending the area. In the north, we have observed the expansion of Russian control northwest of Krasnohorivka, where the 31st Mechanized Brigade was pushed back, along with capturing some ground west of the railway near the coke plant. The Russian command does not solely focus on breaking through into Avdivka proper and capturing supply lines into the town. They are also expanding their control northwards, to stretch defending Ukrainian units as much as possible. This tactic was used earlier in the Battle of Bakhmut. Russian progress in the Avdivka sector has been steady, and the momentum has been on their side, as they enjoy manpower and firepower advantages there. The Ukrainian government is reportedly preparing another round of mobilization to alleviate the manpower disadvantage against Russia on several front sectors, including Avdivka. But Russia has not been as successful on other fronts. They have been trying to advance on the North Luhansk front since the summer, but their attempts have failed. On November 24th, the Russian army made very minor progress west of Chavonopopivka and around Liman Pershi, but their attacks towards Sinkivka have been repelled over and over again in the last few months. Around Bakhmut, Russia gained some ground north of Klishchivka, but lost some positions to the AFU near Kudyumivka. Ukraine continues its attempts to solidify its positions in and around Krynki on the left bank of the Dnipro. While Ukraine has not been able to secure logistics to send its armoured force to the left bank on a regular basis, the AFU has been able to rotate troops thanks to its positions on Frolova Island at the Dnipro Delta. It is truly remarkable that Russia has not been able to defeat several hundred Ukrainian marines despite regularly striking them with glide bombs and artillery. The AFU positions on the left bank continue to be aided by their artillery on the right bank and swarms of FPV drones. According to Russian military bloggers, Russian infantry has been suffering painful losses trying to destroy the Ukrainian bridgehead, which the Ukrainian marines have actually managed to expand to the east, west and southwards to the forest belt. But still, it is too early to speak of a Ukrainian breakthrough on the left bank of the Dnipro, at least until the AFU manages to send in heavy equipment and armoured vehicles there regularly. So, generally speaking, the stalemate on the battlefield persists. As General Zelushny stated in his earlier Economist essay, Ukraine needs more support from its Western allies to change the nature of this war. But the slow-paced and decreased foreign military aid continues, also due to the war in Palestine. In his interview with Bloomberg, President Zelensky said that the supply of vital artillery shells has slowed down due to military deliveries to Israel. He warned that without the Western supplies, Ukraine will move backward in this war. A Ukrainian official was later quoted by ABC News, claiming that artillery shell deliveries to Ukraine have fallen by more than 30% since the start of the war in Gaza. 
In his interview, the Lithuanian foreign minister, Gabrielius Landsbergis, also complained of lack of military supplies going to Ukraine, arguing that it may give Ukraine no other choice but to negotiate with Russia. He criticized the EU's exceedingly long decision-making process, rightly adding, it looks comical when we see North Korea is helping Russia more than the European Union is for Ukraine. However decreased and slow, the military aid continued flowing and being pledged to Ukraine. On November 17th, the Dutch defense minister Alongren promised 2 billion euros in military aid to Ukraine in 2024. On November 20th, the United States pledged one of the smallest military aid packages since the start of the war, worth only $100 million. It included 155 and 105 mm artillery shells, javelins, towels and stingers, along with a new HIMARS system, which is reportedly fit for launching GLSDBs. Until the impasse in Congress is resolved, the American aid is likely to remain small. Still, Ukraine would be happy to hear that the new House Speaker, Mike Johnson, said that he is confident and optimistic that additional aid for Ukraine can be approved very soon. Germany continues its months-long trend of leading the way in aiding Ukraine, as on November 21st, the German Defense Minister, Pistorius, announced a 1.3 billion euro military aid package, which includes four Iris-T air defense systems, 20,155mm shells, anti-tank mines, surveillance drones and detection systems, along with other equipment. Germany also delivered 20 Marda infantry fighting vehicles and one Vicent-1 mine-clearing tank. Later, the German ambassador in Kyiv informed about Berlin's intention to send an additional Patriot system in anticipation of Russia's winter airstrike campaign. Lithuania delivered small arms ammunition, remote detonation systems, and winter equipment to Ukraine. On November 22nd, Bulgaria approved the transfer of 100 decommissioned armoured personnel carriers, while EU President Ursula von der Leyen announced the transfer of 1.5 billion euros of macroeconomic aid. The European Commission also announced the allocation of 50 million euros for reconstructing Ukrainian ports damaged by Russian attacks. On November 24th, Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau pledged small arms and ammunition. Ukraine's Western allies are also working on schemes to increase Kyiv's domestic military production. The US and Ukraine have announced a military industry conference in Washington on December 6th to 7th, aiming to boost joint military production. Bloomberg also reported the EU's intention to assist Ukraine with domestic defense production. But all this is coming against the backdrop of rumors of the West's intention to push Ukraine towards negotiations with Russia. Putin and his officials pay lip service to Russia's openness to negotiations with Kyiv, but insist on major concessions. This does not prevent Ukraine's Western allies from making statements that hint at their interest in restarting talks with Russia soon. On November 20th, the official Twitter account of the US mission to NATO posted, Ukraine has taken back more than half of its territory seized by Russia's forces since February 2022. In this tough and dynamic battle, Ukraine's soldiers are fighting bravely every single day, and they continue to inspire the world with their bravery and courage. We will continue to support them to be in the strongest possible position at the negotiating table when the time comes. We continue to stand united with Ukraine while they defend their freedom. The critical point here is supporting Ukraine until it is at the strongest possible position at the negotiating table. On the one hand, if the United States wants to help Ukraine have a strong hand in talks with Russia, both the US and the EU have to give Ukraine much more than they have been giving in recent months, which would actually be a decent scenario for Kyiv, given where things stand now. On the other hand, this is yet another statement indicating that the as long as it takes and until victory mood has turned into let's negotiate. Another nagging issue for Ukraine is a new problem it is experiencing with one of its closest allies, Poland. Polish truck drivers have been blocking border crossings with Ukraine since November 6th, protesting against preferential treatment for their Ukrainian colleagues. Chairman of the Confederation Party, a nationalist known for his pro-Russian position, Rafael Mekler, is the organizer of this action, which is hurting the pace of important deliveries to Ukraine. As of November 30th, the issue has not been resolved. For months now, there have been rumblings of a brewing conflict between two of the most prominent figures of Ukraine's resistance against Russia, President Zelensky and Commander-in-Chief Zelushny. Zelensky galvanized Ukrainian society to fight against the odds and persuade the West to give weapons to the Ukrainian army, 
which stood tall when everyone expected it to crumble and eventually liberated large swathes of territory under the leadership of Zelushny. Failure of the summer counteroffensive, growing Ukrainian fatigue, and diminishing supplies from the West are major sources of frustration for the Ukrainian leadership. Some disagreement between political and military leaders is understandable, but statements made by Ukrainian officials, politicians, and journalists indicate that disagreements between political and military leadership may be more serious. In his recent interview, Zelensky said, With all respect to General Zelushny and to all the commanders who are on the battlefield, there is an absolute understanding of the hierarchy, and that is it, there can't be two, three, four, five. In an interview, the head of the parliamentary group of Zelensky's party, David Arakamia, said that the military command does not have a war plan for 2024. Another MP from Zelensky's party later reiterated this claim and called to dismiss Zelushny for that. Former advisor of the presidential office, Aristovich, who recently became a harsh critic of Zelensky, and the prominent military journalist Yuri Butazov also confirmed problems between Zelensky and Zelushny. Such a public discussion of internal problems in the Ukrainian leadership is a massive gift for the Russian propaganda, which has been busy amplifying this problem. Ukrainian military intelligence has recently stated that Russia has dedicated $1.5 billion to the Maidan 3 campaign, aimed at exacerbating internal disagreements in Ukraine. After surviving the Ukrainian counteroffensive largely unscathed and launching its own assault on Avdivka, Russia is feeling more confident. Putin has long been a believer in the weakness of the West and has been playing a long game to take advantage of the Ukraine fatigue in Europe and America. The war of attrition is playing into Russia's hands, and although a simmering discontent with the situation in Russia persists in part of the population, it seems like it is largely immune to any hardships suffered at home and the many deaths caused by the war. Russia is already preparing for the arrival of the F-16 in 2024 by updating its A-50 early warning aircraft. The US official John Kirby stated that Russia is already buying glide bombs from Iran and is also considering the supply of short-range ballistic missiles. According to Ukraine's Air Force, Russia has saved up almost 900 missiles for strikes on Ukrainian infrastructure in the winter, which it will probably start launching fairly soon. On November 25th, they launched the single largest drone attack on Ukraine since the start of the war, with 75 Shahed drones. The Ukrainian drone engineers told Forbes that Russia is now producing six times more FPV drones than Ukraine. Cheap, easily replaceable and effective FPV drones have been very important for both sides in this war, and after having an early advantage, it looks like Russia is now surpassing Ukraine in this matter. One of the ways to solve this problem is by having better electronic warfare tools, which Zelushny pointed out as an area where Ukraine needs a breakthrough in his earlier Economist essay. Russia manages to maintain its industrial capacity to produce more weapons by purchasing technology from countries which have not joined the sanctions against Russia, with money they earn from continuing to sell energy to Europe, along with other sources of income. According to reports, the EU member states purchased 6.1 billion euros of natural gas from Russia in the first nine months of 2023. As the military analyst Michael Kaufman puts it, in Ukraine, the level of fighting has gone to a place where the individual tree lines all have a name. Tree lines have become critical objectives. But this does not mean that the fighting is less bloody than before. Russia is pushing hard to advance on the battlefield, as it has seemingly recaptured the strategic initiative in a war that has already seen several momentum swings. Ukraine is working on persuading its Western partners to send more aid, along with carrying out other measures to overcome its difficulties and it must maintain internal unity to have a chance of withstanding another round of Russian pressure, as it is fighting hard to stop the Russian ground forces and bracing for another campaign of winter missile and drone attacks. Now let's look at the visually confirmed equipment losses provided by the Oryx blog. As of November 30th, Russia has lost at least 2,510 tanks, 5,162 vehicles, 260 command posts and communication stations, 1,050 artillery systems and vehicles, 315 multiple rocket launchers, 64 aircraft, 132 helicopters, and 322 drones. Ukraine has lost at least 693 tanks, 2,175 vehicles, 18 command posts and communication stations, 445 artillery systems and vehicles, 50 multiple rocket launchers, 78 aircraft, 36 helicopters, and 232 drones. 
More videos on the Russian invasion of Ukraine are on the way, so make sure to subscribe and press the bell button. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently we've started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.